Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Christian Bicasa. This week we've got Brian Hilbert on the line. Brian, you're out of Colorado Springs. You've been guiding for a little over 20 years now, which is, uh, I think you had mentioned before, a feat, uh, but maybe not one uh, you're most proud of or least proud of at the same time. So uh, <laughs> it's great to have you on the show. Um you know, I think what's really interesting about your background that I, I like, you started guiding out of high school, um, wasn't necessarily the career path that you thought you were going to take, but you fell in love with the um, the sport. Um, you did some time in Alaska. You spent quite a bit of time in the Pacific Northwest, not only guiding fishing, but guiding a lot of waterfowl and hunting uh, scenarios as well. So there's some quite a bit of versatility there in um, doing your homework and, uh, you know, studying the environment, knowing what you're going after, et cetera. And then you made a move to Colorado Springs and you've been in Colorado Springs fishing uh, the general region uh, of that area, uh, moving between a couple different outfitters. And now, um, if I recall, anglers, covey and trout trickers are your two primary outfits that you work with. Um, welcome to the show, man. It's, it's great to have you. Appreciate it. Uh, really happy to be here and excited to uh, be on the show. Yeah, man. So today what we're going to do is jump into a couple scenarios. One is, um, I think, really interesting. We chit-chatted about, and that was regional versatility or just versatility in general and how you can maybe uh, apply that to your local region uh, and get the most out of it. And then we're going to wrap up the show with uh, a nymphing style that you've kind of developed and made your own um, in many ways and give a lot of detail on that so people can try and uh, repeat that at home. So I'm looking forward to both of these topics because I think they're uh, something that will really help out a lot. Myself in particular, um, you know, I'm in Park City, Utah, and you know, there's five to eight hour radius around here and there's all kinds of different, you know, types of waters, uh, types of species, et cetera. And I think versatility is really cool because it allows you to optimize, you know, your experience um, for the region. So uh, why don't you go ahead and give us a little bit, a little bit of background on that um, and, and why it's so important to you uh, as a guide and or an angler, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. Sure. Sounds good, man. Uh, yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm one of the, the, lucky ones or fortunate ones that gets to um, guide year round and make a career of this. This uh, being a fly fishing guide has uh, been my uh, sole source of income uh, for years now. And uh, you know, the, the big thing I found here in Colorado, um, although, you know, we, we have a year round fishery here in Colorado, there's really a, a short, um, seasonal season, if you will, uh, where there's a lot of uh, tourism that comes in. A lot of folks visit here from Texas and California, and um, you can certainly be as busy as you want to be uh, June through September, but if if I want to make a living doing this, um, I certainly can't do so by just guiding four months out of the year. And so to be able to guide year-round, I'm having to um, really take advantage of all the different uh, fisheries we have. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much kind of in a, we'll call it a five hour radius of Colorado Springs or the Denver area. And, um, you know, over the years been able to develop a client base and, um, you know, the introduce a lot of my clients to certain fisheries or types of fly fishing that maybe they, uh, didn't know they would be interested in or didn't know that they would enjoy. For example, um, you know, I have a lot of really diehard weight clients that have never been on a float trip. And uh, I guide float trips for trout trickers out of Vail Valley on the Colorado Roaring Fork and Eagle Rivers. And uh, I also operate under their permit up in Alcova, Wyoming, uh, on the mm -hmm. North Platte. And okay. so, you know, there's a lot of uh, um, a lot of folks maybe that have never fished out of a boat, never experienced a float trip, and uh, I'm able to offer that to them as well. And, uh, you know, the other big thing I would say I convert people over to is stillwater fishing and I'm guilty of this as well. I, I was not a stillwater guy really growing up. Um, not really actually until I moved here to Colorado Springs uh, and got connected with, uh, John Easton, who's kind of a big stillwater guru in the area. 
And um, I really fell in love with the stillwater fisheries we have here and uh, really enjoyed introducing a lot of my, you know, moving water clients uh, to come out and fish the lakes and uh, explore all that uh, there are, our gold medal uh, reservoirs have to offer here with some really yeah. huge trophy trout. Yeah. Now you mentioned John. John's pretty well known for his his still water um, knowledge, et cetera. What, what was it there that kind of triggered you um, in the relationship with John of, hey, I think I need to bring this into my repertoire. How did he maybe mentor you a little bit? Yeah, sure. He's absolutely been a mentor to me. Um, so to some background, John Easton is the director of services at Ingress Covey. He's a, mm-hmm. um, another longtime career guide. He's been basically guiding his whole adult life here in this area. And I had dabbled a little bit uh, in, in Stillwater when I first moved here. Had a little bit of success, but John really uh, kind of took me under his wing and, and um, you know, showed me how to rig and how to approach the lake because you know, stillwater fishing can be, if you've never done it, it can be very intimidating. You know, it's, it's as fly anglers, we often, <laughs> yeah, we, we approach the river or the stream and we say, okay, there's the deep part and there's behind that rock, a trout should right. be there. You walk out to the lake and it just, it all looks the same. Where do I even start? So, um, really in my opinion, stillwater is not too different from how we approach, uh, the river. We fish a lot of shoals and drop-offs and weed beds and, uh, those trout, feed in a manner that's very similar of how they feed in the river um and a lot of times you know the lake will tell you everything you need to know if you just happen to know where to look uh Mm -hmm. john really kind of um you know was an open book about a lot of his his tactics and his approach and um has been a um a great resource for me to kind of shorten that learning curve on um, yeah how to be successful out on still water and um, and I, I instantly became obsessed. I mean, it's, it's one of my favorite fisheries is to, uh, fish our local lakes that we have here. Yeah. And I like how you described it. The lake will tell you everything you need to know. You just have to have the right lens on, right? Correct. Uh, we approach, approach a river and you have the lens that tells you, you know, certain things to look for, because I think there's so much information out there, um, readily available and there are more, uh, people adept to that. Right. Sure. So often I think we get introduced in that manner and it's like, OK, but then you go to a lake and you're like, man, I look at this blank slate. Well, it's really not that blank. You could look around the lake and see, oh, OK, there's a pour in a talus. Well, there's probably structure there. There's a shoal I can see because it's clear water or the weed bed, et cetera. It's going to tell you, but you may not necessarily know what to look for. Sure, sure. Yeah. And I, I think. uh Fly fishing in general, at least for trout, is a lot to do with observation. Whether you're on still water or river, um, it really both scenarios will tell you uh, exactly what you need to be doing. Again, if you just know where to look, if you're um, paying attention to what you know the current bug life is doing, watching how fish are feeding, how they're traveling, are they sitting low in the hole? Are they suspended? Um, are we seeing bugs flying around? Are we seeing bugs swim up to the surface? There's a lot of things that we as fly fishers can do simply by observing mm-hmm. that will help us be more successful out on the water if we just take a minute uh, to sit down and watch. Um, and a lot of the classes I teach, Strangler's Covey, that's one of the biggest things I emphasize is be a master of observation. Uh, being able to go out on the water, don't be in a hurry to rig up and just get out there and flop a cast out there. Let's have some strategy behind it. Let's take a mm-hmm. moment to just sit down, watch what the fish are doing, watch what the bugs are doing, watch what the water's doing. And uh, if we take all the information available to us, uh, we can form, formulate, excuse me, a good game plan. Um, and at least instead of just guessing, we have a educated guess, so to say, right. and then work off of that. Yep. Yep. I like that. It's, it's like a decision tree, right? Sure. You're kind of building up that decision tree. Okay. Now this occurred. Uh, I'm going to take this route, you know, and mm-hmm. start to add to your repertoire. You know, I really like this topic of still water. Um, we're going to stay on it for a little bit. Uh, one other thing I wanted to, to, to quickly cover is you, you spend a lot of time uh, hunting, et cetera. And in hunting in particular, there's, typically seasonality to it, right? And a lot of observation occurs pre-season. I'm making my plan, I'm observing, are they in the zone? Where are they at? What are they doing on a daily, weekly basis, et cetera? And I, I think that's something that's overlooked in, in still water, in particular when you're changing elevations or species, et cetera. Could you 
talk about some of those elements. For example, um, you know, Christian, I know that the feeding is going to occur best at these elevations at maybe these times of year, or if I'm going after these species, they may be fattening up at different times for different spawns, et cetera. But what, do you, what do you take into um, consideration in those scenarios? Yeah, sure. So um, really here, here in Colorado, we have a, a, a pretty long still water season, if you will. We have a lot of ice off, um, when our lakes open up and start to, the ice starts to recede away, it's happening uh, really as early as late March, uh, early April. And a lot of our lakes are opening up to fishing, uh, you know, really around that time. Um, when the ice is first coming off the lake, and, and really this is true for any lake, regardless of elevation, uh, you have a, a, a almost like a, a feeding switch that gets turned on because for the first time there's, uh, you know, water is warming up, bugs are getting active, scuds are getting active, and the fish are cruising the shorelines where most of that food is concentrated. Um, and then as the ice recedes and the lake starts to warm up, there's, um, you know, definitely the lake does a full change throughout the season as things warm up as far as where the fish are going to be, what they might be feeding on, um, you know, early, early spring, this time of year, we're uh, just about, I guess we're right at the beginning of May. Um, it's, it's still, um, I'm fishing pretty close to shore. I'm fishing pretty shallow. Uh, we still have a lot of fish that are spawning in the lake, uh, that are feeding on eggs and small chronomids, uh, water boatmen. Um, and then as the season is going to progress, or maybe you go into higher elevation, uh, terrestrials come into play and, you know, uh, they start feeding on top and, uh, we have different hatches that occur kind of uh, throughout the season. Um, and as the water warms up, maybe the fish are going a little bit deeper. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of um, maybe a, be a, a beginning, middle, and end season here out on the lakes for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you find that your, your um, guests, did they do research on that themselves? Uh, maybe maybe the more advanced anglers, right? You know, want to learn and understand why and how the still water situation is working for them, or is it something that um, you don't really see very often? Um, I I think certainly there's a lot of anglers who like to do their own re uh, research. Uh, anglers Covey um, does a lot of classes and seminars mm. and uh, different. Um, educational pieces for people that are wanting to get into still water. Um, you know, I'm of the opinion that fly fishing is one of those sports that no one will ever master. You'll never know everything right. there is to know about fly fishing. And as right. soon as you do think that you know everything, you're actually uh, moving backwards as an angler. I think it's important for us to always keep an open mind. And uh, regardless of how long you've been fly fishing, to be able to learn new things. And, you know, we have a lot of technological advances that have come to the sport. Um, but uh, uh, as, as far as, you know, doing our own research, uh, there's certainly no substitute for time on the water, right? Um, you can certainly um, shorten the learning curve by going with somebody that has a ton of experience. Uh, right. You know, for as such, you know, going on a guided trip on the lake, you're going to learn a lot more uh, during that trip duration than, you know, probably going out just 10 times on your own, trying to figure it out on your own. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would, I would say um, in, at least here locally, uh, the, the classes and seminars we do at Angler's Cubby for Stillwater, they're Stillwater focused, uh, are a huge success and yeah. um, have a lot of people uh, very eager to learn, you know, new places to fish is uh, that, you know, the nice thing about lakes is they're not near as crowded as a lot of our rivers. Uh, we have, right. we have a lot of, uh, rivers within an hour drive of, um, Colorado Springs here, the South Platte and the Arkansas tailwater that, um, you know, really can be driving people away because they're so crowded. Um, right. I think there's a, definitely a crowd that is looking to learn of other areas to fish and other techniques to fish to kind of get away from the crowds and, and mm -hmm. still water offers that. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I I personally like to do a lot of um, research, studying techniques or um, bo bodies of water, et cetera, before I go. And the biggest thing for me, Brian, is 
if I'm going with a guide, it's it's expensive, right? Sure, I mean, sure. It's, it's worth it, in my opinion. But what I like is to be able to go, okay, I have this somewhat of an understanding of what we're going to do or style or body of water, et cetera. And then when I get out there and I'm getting the mentorship or I'm getting the guidance and et cetera, I can start to relate it back to, oh, that's what they were talking about. And it, it seems to kind of sink in a little better for me sure. um, as a takeaway. So you know, that's kind of where I was, I was wondering, you know, how much you see of that. Um, well, Cause a lot of people guide and they go, Oh yeah. You know, people just want to get on fish for the most part. Sure, There's sure. maybe 20% or less. That's really, they're looking to advance their angling, et cetera. Sure. It's curious what your clientele was like. Well, I'll tell you this, um, and this is maybe more of a tip. Uh, in today's fly fishing world, we have um, way more resources to learn how to do this <laughs> than we did 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, when I first started fly fishing when I was a kid, the, the way you learned how to fly fish was you went to the fly shop or the library and opened a book, you know, right. and uh, there wasn't, um, you know, a, a lot of online options, um, you know, that you could just jump on. For example, YouTube is an incredible resource. And um, I've, I would say I, I've turned to YouTube uh, for, for learning how to fish still water, uh, maybe more than anything else. And mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of really good information, uh, you know, available in YouTube videos. Uh, not all of it valid, but most of it applicable. Um, that's free. And if you're, you're willing to spend the time and, and, you know, do your research in that regard, um, it's a great place to start or to take, you know, obviously not everyone can afford to go with a guide for, you know, multiple trips a month. Uh, but if you go on one guided trip and you, you know, watch several YouTube videos of, uh, around the topic, um, and then you're going out there and doing your trial and error on your own. Uh, yeah. it's really easy. Like you said, to be able to be like, Oh yeah, I remember, you know, in this Phil Rowley video, he was talking about this and you know, Oh yeah, the guy did this and be able to put it together and kind of adapt right. your own program. Yeah. And you start to see commonality, right? Sure. You're going to sure. watch five videos and there's going to be a handful of things that are covered in every video. Correct. It's like, okay, that's your baseline. The other things, yeah, I'll experiment with and find out what works for me. Sure. But I'm going to use that baseline. I like it. Mm -hmm. So let's talk, a little, let's get back to the regionality standpoint um, and versatility. You've got all kinds of different waters. You mentioned a few, um, the plat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they all fish a little bit different. Yeah. So, um, you yeah, know, talk a little bit about that. Sure. So, uh, you know, we're, I, I'm extremely fortunate uh, to, to work for, the two companies that I do, Angus Covey and Trout Trickers, Angus Covey holds uh, 28 different permits uh, for different waters, and I have a lot of options to be able to take people fishing uh, mm -hmm. anywhere from, you know, kind of smaller stream, uh, the, you know, almost creek-like settings where you're casting small dry flies, you know, to wild brown trout, uh, to some of the bigger uh, rivers that we fish around here, like, uh, the Arkansas tailwater, which is, uh, you know, during the summer is, uh, definitely a, um, a larger scale type fishery that, you know, can run anywhere from 600 to 1200 CFS at times. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the probably most famous river that, or uh, most popular, I should say, is the, the South Platte, you know, around Deckers and Cheeseman Canyon and 11 mile, uh, which yeah. we have permits for all of. And, uh, more of a, an exclusive fishery. There's not a lot of outfitters get to guide in Cheeseman and uh, 11 Mile, but you know, being able to take clients in there, um, which in my opinion, it's it, it's it's got to be in the top five most beautiful places to catch a trout in the country. Um, it, it's 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 really really neat, and you know, it it makes it uh, for me from a guide standpoint. Uh, no two days are the same, right? I'm yeah. not. I don't experience a lot of burnout because I'm doing so many different things and there's uh, so many different fisheries and techniques and tactics for each piece of water uh, that I'm not just going out and tying on the same three bugs and standing clients on the same hole. And okay, uh, I've caught this fish 15 times now this year. You know, I really don't run into a lot of that uh, yeah. because I'm able to, you know, move around so much uh, just here uh, on the front range. Yeah, that's, that's a great point is, 
being able to just keep yourself entertained sure. from a standpoint of like, Hey, I'm always trying different things, going to different rivers, et cetera, different styles. And I bet, um, your experience up in the happy Valley too, also has brought quite a bit to you. I mean, you're fishing rivers like the Columbia and the Claca and et cetera, that are, you know, big bodies of water, um, and change, but then there's also all those tribs up there, uh, too, that feed those big bodies of water. So do you feel like that had a really significant effect on your, um, ability to build up your versatility in the, in the Denver area? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I did a, I did a lot in Oregon of just, um, not just guiding fly fishing, but, uh, you know, guiding a lot of terminal gear for salmon and steelhead and whatnot as well. I would Mm -hmm. say the, the biggest thing is, um, you know, let's just use steelhead as an example. Uh, steelhead are still a, 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 a trout, you know, more or less a sea run trout. Yeah. And uh, reading water is, is probably the biggest thing that, um, you know, maybe helped helped me as a guide moving over here to Colorado and getting trout full time. Because um, at the end of the day, trout water is trout water no matter where you go. Trout, are they like to be in the same kind of water and and hold in the same type of depths and currents and current speeds um, and being able to kind of see the river in the same manner, maybe that I was looking in Oregon, um, whether the river is, you know, a huge river, like, um, you know, the Colorado here is, uh, you know, peak runoff, we're running 12, 15,000 CFS and, you know, probably around 2000 during fishing season or a little Creek that's running at 20 CFS. um, You know, really the trout are, they're going to be in the same types of spots, just on a larger or smaller scale, so to say. Um, yeah. So that certainly helped me, you know, kind of develop as a guide and um, certainly my time in Alaska as well. You know, you, um, if, if you're wanting to get into guiding, that would be my biggest tip is to go spend a summer in Alaska because it, it certainly accelerates the learning curve. You get to do a ton of trips and uh, catch a ton of fish and, uh, you know, really kind of develop your guide style. Um on a faster pace, you know, than maybe you would down here in a shorter season. Yeah, I think um, that's a great tip. And people will often correlate uh, areas like Alaska and they say, well, yeah, but the fish are so plentiful. It's, it's a little easier. It's a little this or a little that. <laughs> but, but the reality to me is, yeah, the fish are plentiful. Maybe it is a little easier in some ways, shapes or forms, but the water's crystal clear the, the fish are of more volume. So you, you have two elements there that come into play. One is because the water is so crystal clear, I can see the fish because the volume may be much higher. I start to understand how they travel, where they sit, where they lay up in their environment, et cetera. And then I get more and more shots and I get more and more shots on the whole other end of the spectrum, which is after you actually set the hook. Yep. So, um, you know, from an experience standpoint, it's an absolute um, game changer from a learning curve, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, my my biggest takeaway from guiding in Alaska uh, actually has very little to do with fishing at all. Um, you know, because at the end of the day, being a, a good guide is not about catching a million fish every single day. <laughs> right. right? Uh, you can, you know, go and catch a million fish but if people don't like you and you don't have good customer service, they're probably <laughs> right. not going with you again. Right. You know, so yeah. um, I, I help out with a lot of our guide schools here. And I've, I've, I've taught a lot of guide schools in the past. And I tell everybody the same thing. Um, your goal should be if you take a client out and get skunked, he's still going to call you again. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it's a lot of these younger guys getting into guiding get so caught up in thinking it's all about numbers and I got to produce fish and this is what the people come for. Um, when in reality, in my opinion, uh, guiding certainly has to do with catching fish, but there are things that you can do uh, to create and cater a wonderful experience for your guest without, you know, putting 30 fish in the net. Uh, yeah, certainly yeah. the numbers days are fun and memorable, but yeah. uh, even the best guides in the country don't go out and just, you know, have these banger days every single day. So mm-hmm. Alaska, I learned a lot about, uh, you know, a lot of the lodges I worked for were kind of on the higher end. And uh, I learned how to do an excellent shore lunch. I learned how to coach clients properly and how to land fish properly. And, you know, the best way to um, uh, 
you know, like you said, you get a lot of volume, a lot of shots at um, working on your netting skills and, right. uh, you know, just uh, catering to people's adventure and knowing, explaining wildlife and explaining, you know, the region and the history and uh, yeah. everything. The that's all in, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. All, it's, you know, the, the, the experience, yes, certainly people, when they go out with a the guide, they're there to catch fish, but they're also there to learn and to have a great experience. And so um, Alaska made me a better teacher. It made me a better host, and it certainly um, made me uh, better at customer service, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think you're, you nailed it on the head. That holistic experience is different than just going out and banging fish, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's totally different. And then your ability to relate to people, right? You know, conversation. Hey, you know, what are you about? Let me learn about you a little bit today. Yeah, exactly, uh -huh. exactly. And, you know, me... For myself, being able to do this full time uh, is extremely dependent on having a very high repeat rate. Um, I have, um, uh, I, I would say, almost half of the trips I do for the year are repeat clients that uh, you know go with me year after year after year, uh, multiple times a season, and uh, you know it, it's certainly. I, I like to think I catch a lot of fish, but with all those people, I've certainly had slow days as well. Um, yeah. You know, so young guides, I always tell them, you know, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, uh, you should be able to take people out and have a slow day and they still want to go with you again because they saw you made an effort and, and put everything you had into the trip to make a great all around experience. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even if the fish didn't cooperate that day, you're, um, you know, still kind of showing, uh, you know, who you are as a guide and as a teacher and, um, you know, get people to want to go with you again. Yeah. It's funny. Cause you, I've wrapped up a lot of days where you look at your buddy on the boat and you go, you know, the, the guide steps out of the boat. The first thing he goes, Hey, how, how do you want to tip today? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and the conversation between you and your buddy is, well, dude, you know, like we had a good day. It was fun. We didn't catch a lot of fish, but like he was grinding. He was hustling. It's not like he wasn't trying. And versus, you know, we kind of did a lot of running around. It didn't seem like he was, he knew where he was going or had a plan. And, you know, lunch was cut a little short. And, uh, you know, those are the conversations that are realistic. Right? Sure. You know, because I just slapped down, you know, a couple hundred dollars on a guided trip. I expected a a certain amount and that conversation to real, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to pull out another wad of cash and hand to this guy. And, um, you know, if I saw the grind and the hustle and the effort, um, or I learned something, you're like, oh yeah, I definitely, you know, come back. It was just the day. But then when you get the other scenario where it's like, they were only on fish. And then once that wasn't happening, it was like panic and almost like a loss. Right? Sure. They just don't know what to do. And that really, in my opinion, separates, uh, you know, guides. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll add on to that. Uh, you know, <clears throat> as a fly fishing guide, and I think this, uh, I think probably the younger guides out there maybe can relate, or at least, you know, maybe you're wanting to get into guiding, you're newer to guiding. We get really caught up in the things we can't control. And we try to control those things like, man, uh, the, the hatch happened yesterday at 11. Now it's noon. I haven't seen a single bug. And um, rather than focusing on the stuff we can control, right, I can control how clean my boat is. And, you know, I can control the quality of the lunch. I can control the cleansiness and the quality of my gear. And I can control um, my attitude and how much effort I'm putting into the day, right? And so if I focus on the things that I can control and not, you know, the things I can't, but the weather, the hatches, what the fish are doing. Um, generally, I'm I'm outputting a very high quality trip. You know, my boat mm -hmm. is immaculate every day because I take the time to wash it after every single trip. No one is ever going to get into my boat and it's going to be dirty or muddy or have empty beer cans in it or anything like that. Uh, you know, people don't always remember a clean boat, but they always remember a dirty one. Always, yeah. you know, right. and yeah. uh you know, uh, same with the lunch, you know, um, I tend to, um, 
I think it's very important to go above and beyond with a great lunch. Uh, you know, trout trickers, um, it's, it's actually a, a requirement for all our lunches. We, we grill and we do a nice uh, grilled quail and wild game lunch um, with a, a dessert. We pull over and cook everything right on the side of the river and uh, just go on that extra mile, you know, to um, it, it create a high quality experience. And, yeah. uh, you know, like, like you said, you know, um, it's clients certainly are going to remember the fishing, uh, but all the other details going to guide a trip, I think uh, yeah. sometimes maybe don't get the attention that they need. Yeah. I <laughs> pay attention, everyone. That was just, uh, some of the best advice I've heard on the show from a, from a guy perspective. It really is, you know, about controlling what you can in so many ways. And that's, that's three quarters of your day right there. Big time, big time. Right. Yeah. You know, when you, th when you think about it. So yeah, great advice, man. That, that was awesome. Um, let's do this. Well, I want to spend some time. You had talked earlier about, Hey, look, Christian, I have this five hour radius around Colorado Springs, Denver area of the different types of water. Can you just kind of quickly list, um, you know, Hey, these are the waters that I like. I, I fish and you don't have to give away your secrets, et cetera, but you know, these are the, the waters and maybe some of the, the differences of style that you approach those waters in? Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll just start here in Colorado. So um, on the Front Range, I guide the most on the South Platte River uh, between, um, I would say the most between 11 Mile Canyon uh, downstream to Deckers, uh, which is going to, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody's heard of the Dream Stream, uh, the Cheeseman Canyon, um, all those sections of the South Platte, although they are the same river, they all fish incredibly different. Uh, the Dream Stream is kind of a meandering section uh, between two reservoirs that uh, is kind of goes through a meadow. It's almost always really windy there, uh, but offers uh, excellent uh, dry fly fishing and terrestrial fishing, especially in the summer. Uh, the fish are very, uh, very willing to come up and eat a hopper if presented correctly. Um, and, you know, uh, throughout the South Platte, the, it gets a, a fair amount of angling pressure, so the fish aren't dumb either. You know, it's not like mm -hmm. just because it's all gold metal water doesn't mean you're going to the trout farm and you're going to catch 100. Uh, right. These fish absolutely know the difference between the real thing and a poor, poor presentation. Uh, you know, so my big thing, in uh, regardless of time of year on the South Platte, is I love to sight fish. And I, I, there is, I think we can all relate. There's something exciting about watching a trout feed and putting a cast right where it needs to be and having them come over and eat your fly and catch them um, versus just blindly, you know, nymphing a run and your bobber goes down and you set the hook. It, casting to a feeding trout, whether it's a dry fly or a nymph rig, is just there's something exciting about that and something that um, I, I, I prefer to do certainly uh, on any of my guided trips. I'm always trying yeah. to, um, you know, if we can sight fish, that's what we're going to do. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the intimacy, I think it's the intimacy. That's for a good me. way to put it. Yeah. And, and it's the, um, I mean, <laughs> you're, you are, you're tricking a fish, you're duping a fish, whatever you want to call it. it. They may have this as a pea brain fish, but I outsmarted them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, right. But you know, there's something about that. Like, Hey, look, I, I mentally put a plan together, made my presentation and it worked. Yep. It was exactly. It's, it's proof of concept in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And then, uh, you know, I, I fish the Arkansas tailwater a lot, which is uh, just South of Colorado Springs, about an hour. Um, really high quality fish. There's a lot of fish, um, but they're not dummies either. And uh, oftentimes we're requiring extremely small flies, uh, you know, 22, 24 betas patterns, uh, uh, even, you know, sometimes smaller in the midge category. Uh, they're extremely, um, extremely sharp. You know, we're using light tippet and, uh, you know, you have to have a good presentation. Uh, those fish get, uh, you know, a lot of tension during the winter time and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it can be a challenge to go down there and catch some fish. And so, um, I, I, you know, not to shift gears here, but I, I, uh, tie all my own flies, um, and have a lot of patterns that I've, I'm, I'm, you could say I'm somewhat of a bug nerd. 
I do a lot of mm-hmm. sayings and a lot of throat pumps and take a lot of pictures and bring all that back to the bench. And I'm, I'm always trying to uh, come up with fly patterns that um, are exact imitations uh, to what we're finding in the river. And mm-hmm. uh, I think that's absolutely yielded to a lot of my success down on the Arkansas tailwater is uh, just becoming an absolute bug nerd. I would say I'm maybe just as much of a um, insect fanatic, um, you know, an entomology than I said, as I am obsessed with fly fishing. Yeah. Uh, we're actually, I have an entire room here I'm sitting in today that I've dedicated to fly tying and uh, probably have more money and tying material here than most uh, <laughs> do on a college education. So, uh, but, uh, but yeah, the arc, you know, is uh, kind of your classic, you know, tricky Colorado tailwater fishery. Um, and then we've talked about still water. I, I fish Spinney Reservoir, Levima Reservoir, and Antero Reservoir, the kind of the big three. They're in pretty close proximity to each other. Um, they, they all have huge fish in them. Um, we do a, a variety of uh, indicator fishing, just suspended nymphing, as well as casting and, and, and retrieving flies as well. Um, mm-hmm. uh, those, those fish are, you know, 24 to, to 28 inches and, um, use a 10 foot seven weight. And, uh, there's nothing to stop them. Like there is in the river where they're going to run maybe 20, 30 feet and stop in the lake. They just go. And before you know it, you're in your backing and, and how right. to chase them down. Um, so, uh, you know, a little bit different, um, I did a little bit different ta- tackle when it comes to uh, the Stillwater game, uh, but it's still very similar to how we fish our rivers. You know, we're fishing yeah. midges and leeches and stuff like that. Uh, and then we get into float trips, and I I pretty much split my time almost 50-50 doing float trips for trout trickers and weight trips for Angler's Covey. Um, I do do a few float trips on the Arkansas tailwater for Angler's Covey, but primarily my floating is uh, up in the Vail Valley on the Colorado, the Eagle, and the Roaring Fork. Uh, which is a totally different ball game, right? Uh, right. We're not, uh, you know, standing in the river and, and picking apart a hole with a hundred different drifts. Uh, a lot of it's on the go. And, uh, you know, I do a lot of hopper dropper fishing in the summertime, uh, you know, fishing. Um, we have incredible dry fly fishing really uh, throughout the whole entire year. We're kind of right in the middle of runoff right now, yeah. uh, which is what brings me up to go fish, uh, seasonally in Wyoming, uh, up on the Gray Reef at Miracle Mile. Uh, trout trickers kind of as a whole, we, we certainly have guides that stayed on here in Colorado during this time of year, but um, really, you know, May 1st through, we'll call it June 10th, uh, a lot of our guys go up there when runoff is kind of, um, you know, at full bore down here in Colorado and nothing's very fishable up there um, in the Bale Valley. And, uh, and fish those tailwaters up there um, in Wyoming, mm-hmm. you know, for six weeks. And yeah. uh, I'm actually, that's what I'm going to be leaving to do. I um, Kind of my day today is I'm doing some Wyoming prep. I'll leave this Friday to go up there to guide for the next five weeks. Okay. All right, cool. Yeah, that was a great rundown. Uh, let's do this. Let's jump into the the tip of the episode. And that's that nymphing <clears throat> style uh, tactic that you've, you know, kind of honed down to your, your own preferences. Um, let's talk through that, uh, yeah. scenario and, and so people can maybe try and repeat it and try it on their own waters. Yeah, certainly. So, um, I, it's not, so, I wouldn't say I definitely didn't invent this style, but certainly have adapted it. Um, a lot of people have probably heard of the term either drop shot nymphing or a bounce rig. Um, you know, fly fish food put out a video about the bounce rig. And my, what I do is somewhat similar to that. Um, and, uh, I, I teach a class an, an advanced nymphing class in English Covey where I go over all this. Um, and it, it's the only way that I rig a nymph rig. Um, and the only way I have for a long time. And, uh, there's, there's, a few really key advantages. Number one um, is it it puts the flies where the fish are feeding. And I'll go over uh, details on why this all happens. Number two, you don't lose any flies. And number three, um, I don't use any tapered leaders or split shot, which, um, uh, you know, if I was uh, uh, using a traditional nymph rig, um, I would be spending hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on leaders and split shot all season if I was using a traditional rig and, you know, breaking off and doing all that. So right. uh, the, the construction of what I do is I use like two and a half to three feet of butt section for my fly line. Um, I, I either 
save all my dry fly leaders, uh, you know, your just typical uh, tapered leader. Um, once I've trimmed them too short, dry fly fishing, I wrap them up and save them. They go in a little puck in my pack, and then uh, I'll utilize those for my nymph rig. So we got two and a half, three feet of this butt section. Think of it as like 20 pound mono. And that's yep. going to go to an oversized barrel swivel. I used to use a tippet ring for this, but I found that a big barrel swivel uh, will prevent the tangling of, around your indicator a lot better than a tippet ring. Mm -hmm. And then I'll use a, a airlock style indicator right against the swivel. Okay, so just picture on the upside or the downside. On the upside, yeah. So on the okay. heavier diameter uh, leader, so on that butt section, I'm gonna have that indicator pegged right against the swivel, and then okay. off of that swivel is where I'm gonna start my fluorocarbon tippet. Now I don't um, I don't step it down or anything. I'm typically running four x, four and a half x, or five x tippet um, off of that swivel, and that's gonna go straight down to my flies. Okay. And now it's going to get, uh, and, and bear with me, I'll do my best to explain for those that aren't watching the video, but uh, I'm going to have my weighted fly, which I, I prefer to use a jig style tungsten bead fly uh, on mm -hmm. the very bottom. And then roughly a foot up from that, I'm running a triple surgeon tag in, just like if you're familiar with Euro nymphing, uh, similar mm -hmm. to how you would set up a Euro rig, right? We have our flies tied off a of tag in. Well, I'll put that tungsten jig on the bottom. And then I'll have a tag in about a foot above that and another tag in a foot above that. And so we'll call it six feet from my swivel down to my jigged fly on the bottom and then two unweighted flies on those tags. Mm -hmm. And the reason I do it this way is, number one, I want my flies to sink down to the bottom where the fish are as quickly as possible. With a tapered leader, there's um, it, it's... You know, let's say you have your indicator down there and then down to your uh, blood knot or, you know, surgeon's knot where you put your split shot. And then off of that, you would attach tippet and your flies and whatnot. When you cast that out, because of the heavy diameter of the tapered leader, it does take a while for the flies to sink down into the zone. So if I were to cast upstream, uh, let's say it takes three to five seconds for my flies to get down. And because the surface current speed is faster than the speed on the bottom, Regardless of how good of a mender I am, from my indicator down where the leader taper leader is the thickest, there's going to be some push and some drag there that's going to elevate my flies out of the zone. Okay, mm -hmm. so if I do a, I cast up and I, I sink three to five seconds, okay, I'm in the zone, I fish for three to five seconds, and now I got some drag at the tail end of my drift, my flies are getting elevated up out of the zone, so I might have done a 15 or 20 second drift and only have my flies down where the fish are for four or five seconds, maybe. Right. With with this setup, because fluorocarbon is going to sink quicker than regular nylon leader material, and it's a thin diameter, it's going to sink down almost immediately in, within a second or two. And as it progresses through the drift, there's not a lot of unnecessary drag, uh, especially if I'm on top of my men's, to where now my flies are down in the zone, you know, 12 to 15, 16, 17 seconds of a 20 second drift. So if mm -hmm. I'm just if I've just tripled the amount of time that my flies are down where the fish are mathematically I should triple the amount of fish that I catch in theory. Right. Uh, at, at least opportunities. At least opportunity, correct. <laughs> There's certainly some play that, you know, you have to have the right bugs on and everything and still get a good presentation. But uh, the, the other thing I like here, and I'll, I'll try to make this quick. So because my weighted fly is on the bottom, a lot of times I'm using either a jig tungsten leech or I have a crane fly larva that I fish, um, something that's going to be just kind of ticking along the bottom. With those tags suspended above that and my line let's just call it at an angle like this mm -hmm. my other two unweighted flies are going to be roughly a foot to 18 inches up off the bottom and trout when they feed if you really take the time to watch trout feed very rarely do they want to go down to eat something off the rocks they want to move to the side or they want to move up so if i'm putting my flies as a constant okay right up off the bottom and they're drifting along staying in that 12 inch and you know 18 inch off the bottom through the whole drift my flies are in the optimum feeding zone for the trout the entire time, as opposed to if I have split shot above my flies, eventually my flies are just tumbled along the rocks on the bottom. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, unless I'm, you know, having to adjust my weight as such to where it doesn't sink all the way. But for the most part, people want to be ticking the bottom with a traditional nymph rig. And my flies are going to be tumbling down, not really where the fish want to eat. 
Um, so it, 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 it's going to, let's say, make it more of a constant as far as fly position. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm casting and fishing with a regular nymph setup, the way, you know, probably 99.9% .9 of people rig up with the split shot above the flies and, you know, tying eye to eye or eye to bend. We've all been there. Our split shot hangs up and, oh man, I'm snagged and I'm reefing on it and I break off. I lost three flies and I got to take the time to tie five knots. If I, for some reason, have that jig fly, which rides hook point up, hang up on a rock or stick and I can't get it out. Usually when I break that off, I lost one fly. I got to tie one knot and I'm back in the game. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and honestly, it's a rarity that I lose flies, maybe a little bit in the spring when there's a lot of sticks and debris in the water. Uh, but for the most part, because that tungsten jig fly is riding hook point up, it's just kind of ticking along. If it does get wedged in a rock, I'm able to kind of just get upstream of it. And pop upstream it out. of it, right. Exactly. And, um, you know, so the last key point that I love about this, um, and, and if the listeners are at all familiar with Euro-style nymphing, European style nymphing, um, in, uh, without question, catches way more fish than a traditional indicator nymph rig. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the reason I believe that is true is because we're in direct contact with the flies when we're in Euro nymphing, and our strike detection increases tenfold. As soon as the fish grab our flies, we either feel it or see it on the cider because our flies are in a tight line scenario. Okay? We're in constant mm -hmm. contact with our flies. Think of this rig that I just explained as a Euro rig but with an indicator. So from my indicator down to my flies, it's a tight straight line the entire time. And no matter which fly the fish grabs throughout the drift, there's going to be an immediate response on my indicator. So our strike detection is going to go up as opposed to if my split shot is ticking along and the fish grabs my flies, I have it's to wait flopping for the, around back yeah, there, right? I have to wait for my split shot to get tight on the fish before it gets tight on the bobber. And so but especially here in our local tailwaters where we have trout that are extremely sharp um, and, and know immediately when they eat my flies that that is not squishy like a bug is supposed to be and it's you know made of metal, they're spitting it right. out before there's usually even a response on the indicator. So if, if in summary, if my strike detection is up, I'm losing less flies, spending more time fishing, my flies are as a constant more in the zone longer, you put all these little tiny advantages together, usually equals one big advantage. And right. uh, it makes me more of an effective fisherman. And um, I'm spending more time with flies in the water and less time adjusting depth and weight and retying and, you know, fishing, mm -hmm. you know, cleaning grass off of flies and all that stuff. You know, instead of 60% of the day spent with flies in the zone, I'm more like 85 or 90% of the day. You add that up over the course of the season, I just, you know, increase the amount of fish I catch by 25% just by yeah. changing my nymph rig a little bit. So, yeah, um, yeah like I said, it's, uh, it's, I, I'm very confident in the setup. I do teach a class for Angler's Covey with, um, in this, in this manner, but, uh, you know, maybe one day I'll, I'll put together something on YouTube for it or something, yeah. but, yeah. uh, it's certainly a, uh, a technique I'm known for. And a lot of the, uh, piqued the curiosity of a lot of the guides that work at, uh, both trout trickers and Angler's Covey. And, uh, it's very effective. Yeah. Brian, I love the way you think it, it that all tied right back to your, your uh, comment earlier about, Hey, work on the things that you can control, right? Certainly. And you just, you just uh, did that. You, you changed from a, um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> scenario in nymphing where you don't have control of your flies to now I do have control of my flies in, in a, uh, scenario of a tight line. Um, do I now have better control of my indicator and how that's responding? Yes. Can I control my weight faster and easier? Yeah. I just change out the fly with a different heavier bead, et cetera. Correct. Yeah. Um, you know, all of those different things. So uh, kudos to you, man. You've really broken it down and, and made a science of it uh, to be expected for a guy with 20 years of experience in, in the industry. And uh, I've heard great things about your, your guiding career and it's been, it's been uh, great having you on the show, man. So thanks again for all the tips. Uh, we'll be back next week, guys, with somebody else. And um, if you want to get a hold of Brian, uh, Brian, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, two ways. You can either reach out to me on Instagram. My handle is just my name. It's going to be Brian with an I, B-R-I-A-N, period C, which is my middle initial, period my last name, Hilbert, H-I-L-B-E-R-T. So that's Brian, period C, period Hilbert. 
and that's on Instagram. Or you can reach out to me, uh, just my cell phone, which is 720-237-2435. Be happy to help you uh, break down that infrig or would love to take you guys on a guided trip. Okay, and repeat that phone number again for us. Yeah, it's just 720-237-2435, and you can either text or call that number. Great, thanks.